also that not only the world tech but also the green finance is one of the next big thing in the fintech sector. According to Dominika Stankiewicz's investment associate at Launchpad Capital, fintechs will play a major role in combining various sources of capital for the green economy. And Marius Jurgilas, board member at Bank of Lithuania, believes that changing our behaviors is never easy. Fintech can make these changes less painful, even pleasant. So welcome, gentlemen, on the stage, and I wish you a pleasant fireside chat. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello, Marius. Hey, Dominic. Uh, I think we can start, uh, start off maybe with the brief intros uh, about yeah. ourselves, if you don't mind. I think it would sure. be great I to... It's a good idea. Great. So my name is Marius. I'm a, as a, uh, our nice presenter presented us, I'm a board member at the Bank of Lithuania. And in my previous life, I, I was a research economist. And for almost 15 years, I've been at uh, various central banks around the world, from Bank of England, uh, Norges Bank, uh, Norwegian Central Bank, and now for the last eight years, uh, Bank of Lithuania. And my name is Dominikas. I represent Launchpad Capital. We are a US-based uh, venture capital firm investing into fintechs. Uh, I represent uh, them in Europe, so scouting and overlooking our investments in Europe. We do early stage in, uh, investments, and tickets range from 100K up to 1 million USD. And green, green economy and green finance, I think, is a very interesting uh, topic for, for fintechs to to tackle. Maybe, Marius, you could give us uh, an overview of why green economy is important, and maybe especially given the uh, political tensions that we have nowadays in, in Europe. would be great to hear your ideas on, on that. Sure. And I'm very thankful for the organizers for you know, focusing on, on this subject. And uh, of course, uh, the keywords of sustainability are becoming maybe overused, um, but I think it, it goes much deeper uh, into the issues and beyond fintech. And uh, we agreed with Dominic to set the scene uh, on, on green economy. And what are the main changes uh, that are happening in the society? And then we'll try to dig deeper and see how those changes can be leveraged uh, by fintech industry. So first of all, uh, green economy is about the change. And uh, the change is happening uh, in, in f four uh, various reasons, uh, four various uh, angles. And uh, the first one that I want to stress is that uh, we have uh, changes in consumer preferences. Um, the things that consumers liked and the things that they preferred uh, are becoming affected by uh, much longer term perspective that uh, younger generation or those who are taking sustainability deep into their heart are you know, really embracing. And uh, that is translating into consumer preference changes. And uh, those financial firms, be it banks, asset managers, insurance companies, or even, uh, I don't know, retail uh, banking industry, uh, those who acknowledge those changes, uh, they can participate in this gigantic change that is happening. That's the first one. Uh, the second one is uh, acknowledging the change in the behavior of financial firms, uh, the industry itself, uh, the type of financing that is needed for this change, and uh, this behavioral change is the second thing that is uh, important to acknowledge. So the first one being consumer preferences. The second is behavioral changes uh, of the firms and uh, people. And uh, all of this would not be taking place 
Sometimes good things do not happen unless the word let's say, nudging the, nudging from the government. And uh, Dominic calls it nudging, I call it regulation. And uh, sometimes you need a little bit of nudging to be pleasant uh, to the industry so that good things start happening. And it's understandable. Sometimes consumer preferences do not take into consideration the effects that my consumption has on the others. So the externalities that we do create. Externalities to the generations that will live after us. So that's the f third one. And the fourth, the most important one, and I left it to the end, is complete change in the ecosystem of energy. Uh, the way we use energy, the way we will produce energy, the way we will consume energy, and from whom. And um, there is uh, a theory, I do not subscribe myself to it, but for the sake of the argument that the geopolitical tensions that we see might be due to the Green Deal that European Union set itself forward, which means that we will not or we will use much less of the polluting energy which is coming from the East. I'll stop here. So that's the scene. And uh, Dominic, uh, let's go back to FinTech. Yep. Um, what do you think, uh, how FinTechs can make uh, this change, uh, this behavioral change, uh, as I said, much more pleasant and how they can facilitate it? Sure. I think there are main, two main things that play a role. Uh, one that uh, was already mentioned is nudging, and the other, other one is connection. I will give you an example. Uh, your uh, Neobank app, you have a very good relationship to it. You have a, you, your notification pops up, you're more than uh, happy to open the, the app, see what's happening, which a lot of legacy uh, players don't have. So fintechs have this very close relationship with the consumer, and that's a very important uh, thing. The second thing is they have an ability to analyze massive amounts of data. Imagine if your neobank or payments company or any other uh, company that has your payments data saw that you made a uh, transfer to UNICEF or to support Amazon forests or you bought a, some kind of a investment into the green economy. So what they can do with this data is they can nudge you to buy more green products and I think this is a very interesting uh, role that legacy players don't necessarily have an ability or don't know yet how to do it. So I think this little nudging using data and the close customer uh, relationship is very important and that's where the fintechs can play a massive role. Second part is the connection. A lot of fintech companies are very lean and mean as we say in the VC world. What it means is that they can connect various stakeholders to one project. Meaning, let's say the government says that we're establishing a new fund that is gonna invest in the green forests in Lithuania. However, the government doesn't know how to do it, but let's say that they need some kind of KPIs or data points, and they can co-invest with private investors. While then the FinTech can come in and say, maybe we can connect retail investors uh, wholesale investors like funds together with the government and co-invest into one because they have the technology and they have the ability to use the data for good. And I think these two, the nudging and connection is a very important part that the fintechs should monetize on and can help the green economy. Um, so maybe uh, getting back to the government a little bit on, on what we've discussed how the government can help fintech, I know it sounds uh, from the VC world coming, uh, it sounds like a little bit uh, arrogant to ask for a government to help, but I think green economy is something that we all have to work in, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts, Maris, about this. Sure. We are all here to help each other. Exactly. Uh, I'm sure. And it's not about making money or monetizing things, it's about helping and making the society a better place. And that's where the government comes in. Uh, but to be more discreet and to answer your question on how the government, uh, I wouldn't call help, but uh, enable, enable this change because you know, the government has spoken. It says 
We want a society which is not consuming fossil fuel. We want a society that is more egalitarian, which, take, which is taking into account social issues and uh, making sure that they use uh, sustainable energy sources. That's what we want. And uh, in that statement, there's already implication, which says what we see is not good enough. And um, going back to nudging, the market forces do not push the consumer or the firms to provide what we want. And you know, the government is not uh, just you know, a self-standing entity. It represents the society. And the society is saying, you know, we don't want to be living in a place where, uh, you know, there is no life after 50 years or the oceans will be taking the place where we live right now. We don't want that. But individual decisions do not lead to the uh, socially optimum outcome. So the government acknowledges this and says, okay, fine, as you said, uh, somehow we need to nudge uh, or change the behavior of the consumers, and I think you know how to do it. What do we have? How can we enable this? We have a lot of data because, you know, we ask for it and you have to give it to us. But sometimes we are not good at providing or giving that data back to you. And um, for good reasons. Uh, why you, why not him or her? Uh, why this specific industry, why not the other one? But we have to find a way to open up the data, and that's my main point, to open up the data for the good. And we need to keep the balance, we need to protect the uh, privacy of consumers, but uh, the public good of uh, providing the data for public needs is something that the government must do. That's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, if we want firms to invest in this change, uh, we want to provide, we need to provide a clear pathway how it will be happening. And sometimes, again, we are not good at this uh, because uh, the legislation or prescriptions uh, that will be coming uh, your way um, in a year or two are not clear. So clear guidance, what to expect, uh, provided with the data, and my third point, global standards, and that's where the place where the governments, plural, and regulators, plural, are really pushing their efforts together right now into setting the scene for the global standards. So the data, predictability in regulation, and global standards. Maybe, Marius, I can just comment on, on that. I think the open data PSD2 is something uh, that helps a lot uh, with opening the data from, from the banks and the financial institutions. And I think, for the v looking from the VC perspective, we don't really like to invest that much into regulated entities. However, there is, because, let me explain, because it brings an additional risk into the business model that there can be something wrong with the regulation or not compliant to the regulation. But there is nothing worse than the startup being in the gray zone where it might be regulated, but you don't know what's going to happen with it. So we prefer something unregulated, then the second place would go to regulated business, but the worst is, is the gray uh, zone, so to say. And I think uh, EU, and I hope that uh, the governments will push a lot on, on, on this to bring more clarity not only to the fintechs, but to their investors as well. I think that's, that's very import, important. Mm -hmm. So maybe we can reverse the, the help, how fintechs can help uh, the government or you know, public bodies uh, to achieve the objectives that they have set out forward. Sure. Uh, I think the, f the main uh, kind of responsibility from, from the fintechs are that they're the ones who know the technology well. They know what's coming. Uh, they know uh, how, where the world is going in, in technology. While the government officials might not necessarily always know about these technologies because it's not their direct responsibility to follow these. So I think what is important from the, for the fintechs is that to bring awareness about these technologies uh, to talk it with the government, uh, to talk them through, uh, to identify the risks and opportunities that these technologies bring, 
And I think naturally just going uh, into associations and be being as a kind of a community, like Rocket is, is a good example of that community, I think, and the associations here in Lithuania are doing a good job in communicating together with the government and trying to identify the risks and the opportunities that this technology can bring. So I think active participation and communication with the government and other stakeholders is, is very important. Do you think that communication channels are, are there for fintechs, not only in Lithuania? Think about globally. To really you know, convey this message to the decision makers, uh, where is the forum where technological advances of fintech industry you know, can be brought to the level of decision makers? Because you know, sometimes decision makers are only dealing with the most established uh, market participants and you know, high-level meetings don't have many startups participating or sitting around the table. So how do we get that knowledge? Unfortunately, that's, that's true. Uh, usually startups are quite small and it's quite hard for the officials to meet 1,000 startups in the country, like let's say here, right? So I think European Union is doing quite a good job while talking uh, with the community here uh, and all over the European Union. I think there were some implications like PSD2 that doesn't necessarily bring uh, a lot of uh, good to the banks, but maybe more to the startups. And I think there are good discussions happening in Europe. I think globally, we don't have uh, one body or one event where the startups can bring this opportunity. Maybe you know about uh, global events like that. I'm sure I, I know what you're referring to. There are plenty of those events and it's really, I think, good that uh, it, it's fortunate that uh, decision makers are taking participation in those. Uh, in my opinion, it's very important to be open-minded and uh, to acknowledge that there are plenty of good ideas which will lead to nothing and there are plenty of overlooked ideas which will change the world. And uh, a good policymaker uh, must be open-hearted and uh, give it a chance uh, in a measured way, uh, taking the risk. Because if we do, do not take the risks, we'll be stuck with the same technology, which is gas and oil. Because we don't know which uh, type of a battery or you know, source of alternative energy will prevail. And, uh, you know, if, when I say the battery, you know, you imagine uh, some electrolyte, some maybe a hard battery, but our friends in Denmark have a project which is uh, building a square, a square in the ocean. They will pump the water out of the, from that square and it will be the battery. Very risky, but maybe it will be the most efficient one. I don't know. Yep. Talking about the, the good examples in, in the fintech space, can you name a couple of names that uh, you think are doing well to enable the green economy? I'm on a very slippery slope here. Uh, so I chose uh, in a premeditated uh, way uh, some names which I think uh, give a spectrum of solutions that fintech companies can, can do in uh, enabling uh, sustainable economy. And the first one that came on my list uh, was a solution uh, which is being provided by a, a neo bank to an established bank. Uh, there is a country out there called United Kingdom, and there is a bank called uh, uh, Standard Chartered, uh, a global bank. And it's a bank next to which uh, headquarters uh, Greta was you know, protesting because Standard Charter is a major investor in uh, uh, offshore grilling companies and all the other bad things that are happening around the world. And the message came to the decision makers of uh, Standard Charter and they said, we need to do something about it. But we don't have a technology. But there is a startup bank called Starling and they have this technology. Why don't we ask them to provide a solution for us to create a new thing which will enable our customers to invest in sustainable sources, uh, to allocate their funds into sustainable funds and other things. So Standard Chartered 
uh, bought a solution from Starling, and they are launching it. It's yet to be seen, but as I said, it's an example called shoal, like a shoal of fish uh, traveling in the ocean. So that's the first example. The second example, closer to the startup community, is an example of, and there are many similar ones, I'm just picking one. It's called Sugi. It's, uh, it's a solution which enables customers to load their data on what they are keeping their funds in, utilizing open banking, utilizing a UK solution called Money Hub, um, and it scores your carbon footprint. So basically you say, yes, check, uh, get access to my bank account in this bank. Yes, check, I allow you to get access to my pension fund and allow you to get access to my insurance, life insurance policy. And the score comes out and you see it's in the gray zone. You start looking, why is it, why is it in the gray zone? Because whenever I invested, I picked up uh, green. Why is it gray? And it turns out but that uh, the fund allocated your investments to green banks. Those green banks, they have sustainability policy. Sustainability policy means that you know, the board is equal gender, uh, the bank is paperless, and they have carbon footprint measurement. That's it. And there's nothing more green about it. So this is the nudging that it's happening. Uh, you need, we need to provide the data back to the consumers for, for them to understand, you know, what is the impact of your decisions. And the better this message is, the better the, better the response will be. Same way like it is with, uh, with heating bills. If a consumer in some countries can observe the price of electricity um, every hour, they can adjust the consumption. If I have a flat fee, what do I care if the price of electricity right now is 200 compared to five, which it was three months ago? I'll stop here. So these are my examples. Uh, what is your favorite fintech? So one of one of my favorite. Uh, I'm not sure if it can be a cold fintech, but I think in the in the kind of essence of what they do, they are a fintech. It's called O Power. Uh, they were established in 2007 and got acquired by Oracle in 2016. Basically, what they were uh, was a SaaS uh, platform for uh, utility. Uh, B bills. Mm. So what they've done, they tacked, uh, tapped into your bills. They got all of the data. How much are you paying? How much are you spending on, on the, your energy bill? And then what they've did next month, they've sent uh, a report to the consumer, which compared them to other houses in the neighborhood and uh, other houses in the states, uh, in the state where they were, because that was from the United States, and to other similar profiles. And they categorized them as, as the worst users, as the best users, and you were usually somewhere in between. By making this uh, reporting and using only data, they've managed to push the consumers to save up to 50% of their, on their energy bill, without actually changing uh, any equipment, which I think very well uh, tells a story of how we can use the data and how we can nudge the consumer to think that, huh, maybe I'm, I'm really overusing. Maybe, you know, if my neighbor, uh, I think this is an interesting narrative, if my neighbor is using less, maybe I can use it as well because he's a person next door. So why, why am I this bad for the planet? Why am I acting this bad for the planet? Maybe I can, I can do better. And uh, I think that that is a beautiful uh, solution. And they've done an exit, which is a very important thing for a venture capital firm, of course. Yeah. If I can add to your story, uh, you, you, yourself, you mentioned, you know, I'm not sure if it is a fintech. What people sometimes overlook, um, fintech must be credit, scoring, uh, 
crowdfunding. But in this context that we are talking, it's about the understanding of consumer decisions and uh, the implications that we can get from uh, just economic transactions. And economic transactions in fintech world are payments. And you know, labeling, categorizing, attaching uh, measurements to those economic transactions is kind of the source of information that can be used in various uh, solutions. So that's why we are talking about fintech in sustainability. At least that's the way I understand it. Yeah, maybe we can use the cliche that uh, data is the new oil and every startup is going to be a fintech startup at the end of the day. So, uh, Marius, let's, let's go a little bit uh, more personal. More personal. Uh, do you invest in, in uh, green economy or green solutions, maybe solar panels, uh, like it's very popular nowadays here? I make uh, green investments every day, but I, I don't invest in uh, solar panels yet. Um, and I have a personal view, which might not be correct. Uh, I think that the, the sales pitch is not, at least for me, it's not resonating. Uh, I'm being sold a product uh, and being sold a promise that if you do this, it will be cheaper. I'm an economist. I know this is bullshit. I know it's cheaper to pollute the country. I know it's cheaper to burn the coal and oil. I know that must be more costly to put you know, new technologies, solar panels, and all the other things. Uh, in the long term, of course, it might be cheaper, but I would, I'm not living in the long term. I live here now. So the pitch is wrong for me. I think the pitch should be, Marius, pay more, and it will be sustainable. And convince me. And we, know, we need to convince more people like me, and then the change will happen. That's, uh, that's a lesson for some of the fintechs here, if you want to nudge Marius in, into buying solar solar. But panels. I know you invest in, uh, in sustainability. What's your story? Uh, actually, I do not invest in sustainability. So no one invests in sustainability. Uh, so hopefully all of you here do that. Uh, actually, what I lack is, is an easy solution that helps me invest every month a certain uh, amount. Uh, automatically, I don't want to uh, put my hands dirty with the investments and, well, put my hand sustainably into the investments and then track and, and monitor all of the things. I want it to be super uh, easy for me. And I think the fintechs can really deliver that. And I think some countries like UK are, are starting to see these solutions pop up. So I really hope that the neobanks, payment companies, or maybe not payments, but e-wallet companies will offer these solutions in Lithuania pretty soon where I can invest and track my uh, investments into sustainability quite easily. So maybe that's, that's one uh, thing as well. So Marius, what, what do you want to leave the audience with as we're running out of time almost? Of course, we have all premeditated talk, but uh, it comes naturally from what we have been discussing that um, what we individually, from what I understood, uh, we're looking for easy solutions, right? Uh, but changing habits, changing behavior, you know, the thing that you have been doing for, for, the, for all your life is not easy. And I think it's an opportunity. Uh, we must change. We like it or we don't. We must change. The society must change. And uh, those that will make and provide the sources and opportunities, how that change can be done less painfully for me, I will pay money for that. That's my message. The government is throwing money, the government sets standards, and the government says we want that change. Consumers don't want it, but they will have to. That's opportunity. And I would say that, you know, changing your behavior is good. I don't know, becoming vegan is nice, not flying with airplanes is good, but I think the real impact, what a person can do is just bringing the technology and maybe creating fintech solutions that can move and nudge the masses towards more sustainable uh, decisions. So I think that would be my message. And yes, thank you. Thank you all. Uh... I come with a chair to sit next to this uh, fireside with you and have a couple of questions here. Thank you. Really nice discussion. 
Um, I really liked, you know, when you asked each other about uh, the sort of uh, uh, fintechs that uh, follow this green agenda, but uh, all the examples were, you know, from abroad. So the question actually from the audience here is, um, how would you describe Lithuanian fintech scene in the terms of green finance? And I will add, there's another actually question which is related to that, and sure. uh, the climate fintech is the trend that's abroad. Uh, will it uh, have future in Lithuania, or are we not mature for that then? I think it will definitely come, come here, because there's a lot of fintech solutions here, so naturally it will uh, evolve here. I think countries in the European Union are catching up, and I think UK is, is not in the European Union anymore, but they're kind of uh, moving towards that direction. And I think Lithuania will naturally move to that direction, especially given the Green Deal, uh, European Union Green Deal. So I think there is a future. I don't think we're there yet. This is definitely a field that people should look in in the early stage. So I think we're in the early stages, which is, in my opinion, one of the most interesting stages for the startups to be. I have an explanation why it's not that prevalent yet in this corner of uh, Europe. It's uh, due to financial uh, development, uh, or to, in human language, the proportion of the assets that consumers have invested in complicated or more complicated than a bank deposit instrument. And if all the money is being kept in just in the bank account, it's very difficult to nudge it from one type of a bank account to another type of a bank account. So I guess uh, the first step is to, pro to get this infrastructure on uh, measurement, which due to the ecosystem that we have developed, we have in, in this region of the world. And the second step is to make sure that people take active participation in financial markets. And while, while they do those decisions, then the solutions that we talked about will become specifically important. Okay, so when do you think this acceleration in the green economy will come? When? Hmm? It's happening right now. Mm -hmm. As we speak, uh, there is a bank uh, in Lithuania which is uh, partnering with a startup, and I will omit the names of both, uh, which uh, the bank is saying, I have provided a lot of mortgages the biggest item on my balance sheet is mortgages. How can I make it more sustainable? Mortgages, what are mortgages about? It's about housing, and housing is, uh, in Lithuania, some of it is not energy efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, can I identify those mortgages which are not energy efficient? Can I package those mortgages into some kind of preset uh, portfolio? and uh, label, it as, label it as an opportunity. Can I upsell uh, to those customers uh, an opportunity to obtain a credit for energy improvement, which I will finance by issuing some financial instrument in the global markets and label it as green. That labeling will enable me to obtain the funding in a much cheaper fashion, which I will channel to energy efficiency improvements in housing. This sounds is happening like a, as we speak. Sounds like a great opportunity both for business and the planet. Um, and another question that I here have is, um, what is the Lithuanian bank strategy for sustainable finance? Bank of Lithuania. Mm -hmm. uh, so first of all, uh, Minister of Finance, uh, and the minister was here in the morning, uh, made public uh, sustain, uh, green finance strategy for Lithuania. And it has multiple points on it. And uh, the most important ones, of, ones there uh, talk about uh, the big regulatory change which is coming towards the financial sector and how do we as institutions, Minister of Finance, Bank of Lithuania, we provide my second item that I talked about, clarity uh, to the financial industry here so that uh, those changes take place faster in this jurisdiction compared to the others, because they will take place all around the world, uh, including Europe uh, and everywhere. But do we want to be consumers of those changes and 
only take the costs because change is costly, compliance is costly, or we provide solutions and sell those solutions to others. So my strategy would be, would be to provide uh, solutions to the rest of the world. Okay, thank you. And the last question to both of you to, to finish off uh, this uh, chat. What, it's a personal question for both of you. What was your most positively impactful financial decision so far? Hmm. Not the solar panels, I hear. Yeah, I unfortunately. Long, long time ago, uh, before my adult, adulthood, um, I made a socially sustainable decision. Uh, one of my friends was short 500 litas and couldn't apply to university. And I had saved 500 litas and I gave her a loan. Green which loan. I, <laughs> not, well, it's social, social <laughs> loan <laughs> because there was no return in it, uh, whatever that I could foresee. And uh, 15 years later, she paid me back. Any interest on that? Hmm? Any interest on that? No. Just social responsibility for providing education for someone. But uh, that person went to university and... That's uh, impactful. Yeah. yeah. Can you beat that, Dominique? Well, <laughs> that's a hard one. But uh, we started a sustainability education center in Tech Park with the colleagues called City Lab. So uh, we've put a lot of hours there. Uh, and now it's like kind of education center slash a restaurant, which teaches the local community about uh, how can you repair an old chair on them or make uh, something nice out of old uh, things. So, and there's trading books and there's like a restaurant for, for families. So I think it's a social one as well, but I think that was my most sustainable investment, I would say. Sounds very nice. Well, thank you guys a lot. Thank you I, uh, for having us. Really pleasure always to have you here. So thank you for coming. Thank you.